of Montgomery, Alabama, and currently lives in Tuskegee, Alabama. After completing seminary school at the Nashville Christian Institute, he enrolled in Alabama State College and earned a law degree at Case Western Reserve in 1954 and opened up a law office in Montgomery, Alabama. His legal career spans a period of over 59 years. His mission in life was that he was determined to destroy everything segregated that he could find. So when Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to serve in her bus, Attorney Gray, one year out of law school, became her lawyer. And this touched off a period known as the Montgomery Bus Boycott. He also represented Dr. King and other participants in the year-long protest. And this event ushered in the modern civil rights movement that would forever change America. And it thrust the movement into the national and international spotlight. He was known as the lawyer of civil rights. One of his landmark cases, which changed history, was the suit he brought against Governor George Wallace of Alabama and the state of Alabama, which resulted in the court order which mandated that the governor and the state protect the marchers as they walked from Selma to Montgomery to present their grievances as a result of being unable to vote. The publicity of this action led to the enactment of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What an accomplishment there. Without him, there likely would have been no March on Selma and no Voting Rights Act. This one man with a stroke of a pen on a legal brief literally changed the course of history. So we should all believe that one of us can also make a difference. His role in the Selma marches is captured in the new movie, Selma. So you have to see this movie if you haven't. Mr. Gray's role is portrayed in the movie by the actor, Cuba Gooding Jr. He also is only one of two Americans elected to the Alabama State Legislature since Reconstruction. Fred Gray continues to practice law. And he's a senior partner at Gray, Langford, Sapp, McGowan, Gray, and Nathanson with offices in Tuskegee and Montgomery, Alabama. He's still working hard to protect our civil rights. His latest book, Just Ride, Bus Ride to Justice, chronicles the exciting story of a courageous life in the courtrooms of America and Gray's impact on civil and human rights. That book will be available for purchase right over that table after he speaks. So with no further ado, I welcome to the podium a legal icon and a giant to which all society owes a debt of gratitude, Mr. Fred David Gray Esquire. What do you say when you listen to a radio fan? Give them all another hand. I want to thank Judge Benson for the wonderful introduction. I want to now I want to thank her, but I want to thank Sorry. your board We're going up there. I'll be back. for having this program. When she asked me about speaking to you almost 18 months ago, even for the event last year, uh, I didn't realize it was a production. It's not just a celebration. But what you have done here is indeed a production. And I will ask, and I'm deviating from what I was going to do, by one of the television persons in an interview before we started, about what do I think Dr. King would feel about what we're doing? As I have observed here today, and when I came early, I even walked all around to meet with the audience. And I have listened very attentively to everyone.
everything that has taken place. I thank the tight program that you have celebrated the 30th anniversary of your celebration marking the respect to Dr. King. Actually and adequately demonstrates what his life and what his work was all about. And you should commend yourself. You have diversity of race. You have diversity of sex. You have diversity, I mean, you go from these young people to middle age to persons like me who've got to be 84. And I think it demonstrates that we all can work together. We all can work toward a common goal. And I'm just delighted that I knew Dr. King. Many of you didn't have that privilege, but I knew him personally. And I thank this program here today, from your march to the youngest one, to the oldest one, regardless of all of it, I think it really adequately depicts the life and work of Dr. King. I think you have an example here of the kind of programs that should exist across the nation as we celebrate this work. Now there's just one thing, you know, if I was wise, what I would do is simply say amen and let you have a good addiction. But if I did that, somebody would be disappointed. But let me say it also that I have so many ties to people in the Detroit area. Some I have seen since I've been here from childhood and we grew up in the same community. Some was my high school and mates in Nashville. Some was my schoolmate in Alabama State in Montgomery. Some have been clients, and some of my National Bar Association members, like uh, past President Reggie Turner, who is here with his family. So I have so many times, and I'm so happy that all of you are here. And just give yourself a hand because you came to celebrate the life and work of Dr. King. To come and speak. I want you to know that Judge Johnson did not fail to tell me, as judges tell lawyers, what I should do. So I'm going to share with you a part of what she told me to do. And whether I do it or not, it will be left up to you. But at least I won't have to appear in her court next week. And this is what she said in that letter. As a civil rights lawyer, author, commentator, and friend of Dr. King, I can think of no better person to pay homage to Dr. King on this anniversary and to give a real perspective to our young people on our history and charge them for future action to sustain Dr. King's dream legacy. Now, I think I qualify for all four of those. I am a civil rights lawyer and have been now for over 60 years and still practice. I'm an author of two books, an autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice, and the Tuskegee Assistance Study, where the federal government took advantage of 623 African Americans in Macon County. And I'm certainly a friend of Dr. King, and I'll tell you a little something about that in just a moment. 
But I want to know, and I'm so impressed by all of our young people who are here, and there's a choice that you want me to say, and I'm going to say something to them. But everybody here who considers themselves a young person, just stand up so we can see you. The judge assigned me a subject, and the subject is from generation to generation embracing the legacy of Dr. King standing up for justice. And that is indeed a good thing. And she also told me how long I ought to talk. Let me just tell you very briefly that I did have the privilege of knowing Dr. King. And while there were some things I was going to tell you, I don't need to tell you because if you, they have a pretty detailed autobiography as to how I got involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I wasn't one who always wanted to be a lawyer. I was coming up in Alabama at the time when black young men could basically only do one or two things, or both, and that's be a preacher and a teacher, and you did them on a segregated basis. And I decided I was going to be both. But you know, after learning a little something about preaching, I came back to Montgomery. I lived on the west side of town. Alabama State, where I was going to learn how to become a teacher on the east side, and I noticed and observed all of the problems our people were having on the buses in Montgomery between 1948 and 1951. I saw our people, and even one person was killed as a result of an altercation. So while I was a junior at Alabama State, I came up with a secret pledge to myself, and I didn't tell anybody about it. And that was I was going to finish college. I was going to go to somebody's law school someday. It's not a class at the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me. Finish law school, come back to Alabama, pass the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. And for 60 years I have tried to do that. And if you want to know about those cases, you can read it in your program or you can get one of the books and see it. However, I said that to you because when I came back to Montgomery, and you know I represented Dr. King, and I represented Rosa Parks, and John Lewis, and when those people were beaten back on bloody Sunday, they called me, and I was in Montgomery, and I drove those 50 miles after they had been beaten. And John Lewis, and Jose Williams, and Mrs. Aurelia Morrington, and others told me about what had happened to them and said, Lawyer, we want to complete this march, but we don't want another meeting. And I say, You have a constitutional right to complete it. You shouldn't be beaten. And if you want me to, I will file a lawsuit. And see if we can't get a federal judge to order the abolish and order the state troopers instead of being you to protect you as you march from Selma to Montgomery. And you know what? Before the close of day, the next day, Monday, 
the Monday after Bloody Sunday, I filed a lawsuit of uh, Jose Williams, John Lewis, Aurelio Gordon, versus Governor George Wallace. George Wallace sent the case down for the following Thursday. We had a four day trial, and as a result of that hearing, they enjoined the governor, made him protect him. We went to Montgomery, and as a result, the Voting Rights Act came to the bend. So when you see in Selma, and Paramount Pictures arranged for me to have a screening audit on the level of the summer. And when you see it, what purports to be the second march, and where the state troopers were there, and then they just disappeared? They didn't disappear just on their own. They disappeared because we had filed a lawsuit since they had beaten them the day before, and they knew that whatever happened that day would be in court on Thursday, and that's why they left. And one of these days, I'll tell you the other part of that story about what Judge Johnson had told me, and what I had told Dr. King, and why Dr. King didn't go in the front. But all of this points out the importance of where we are today. There would have been no Selma to Montgomery March if there had not been a Montgomery bus boycott, because most historians now will tell you that the beginning of the civil rights movement is there. I'm delighted to have been one, along with Joanne Robinson who recommended to Montgomery that Dr. King be the spokesman for our group. He didn't come to Montgomery to start the Civil Rights Movement. He was drafted in there, and it was as a compromise. And if you want to read that, you can find that in Bus Ride to Justice too. But the point is, and the recommendation was made, and after we represented Mrs. Parks, but my first civil rights client was not Dr. King, it was not Rosa Parks, but you know what? It was a 15-year-old girl whose name is Claudette Carter. Many of you don't even know anything about Claudette Carter. But on March the 3rd, 1955, nine months before Rosa Parks did what she did, Claudette Carvin did it without the instructions that I had been giving Mrs. Parks over the last year as we talked and had lunch every day from the time I started practicing until the day, including the one that she was arrested on the 1st of December. This 15-year-old girl who lived in a little town, a little part of Montgomery called King Hill. All of the kids up there had to get the bus, go downtown, change, and go to the back school. Coming back one day, she didn't sit in one of those 10 seats reserved for whites, she sat in another one. But there were more white people there than usual. And Claudette Carvin sat in the seat when whites came in and the driver asked her to get up. She refused to get up. The parents called me and I represented her in that case. I raised constitutional issues, but the judge overruled them. We talked about having a boycott, but we decided that the community was not quite ready. But if there had been no Claudette Carpenter, who did what she did on March the 3rd, 1955. Mrs. Rosa Parks may never have done what she did on December 1st, 1955, because Claudette gave us the courage. And if Mrs. Parks had not done what she did, she would not have been tried on December 5th. There would have been no mass meeting at Hope Street Baptist Church on December 5th. Dr. King would not have been introduced to the nation and to the world. And the whole civil rights movement may have been different, but for 
a 15-year-old girl. Do we have any 15-year-old children here? They've been here all day, and I know they'll march, but I want you to know, while the march is very important, and while the speeches are very important, it is the book actions that really did things. And it took courageous plaintiffs like Claudette, who was a plaintiff ultimately in the case of Brown versus Gale. But you know, it also takes courageous witnesses. And on that bus, there were about eight or ten children. But only one of those children were willing to volunteer and testify for Claudette Carver. And you know what? I found out that young lady whose name was Andy Larkin's son is here with us, and he's one of the security persons. Where is he? He's here someplace anyway. But what I'm telling you is that you don't know who you have and who's doing what. I was supposed to do a lot of things, and I know time, and I know we have a time people there, he may raise you. The time on me in a moment. But the Montgomery Bus Boycott was responsible not only for setting things straight in Montgomery, but also it set the stage for changing the world. We meet here today, and the question is what has happened to Dr. King Green? And there are many people who think that because we now have an African American in the White House and the Attorney General and other key positions, that we have made it and that Dr. King's dream is all over and what's all the fuss about civil rights. And I would be the first one to tell you that we've made a lot of progress. It's a far cry from now until then. But, again, I talk to our young people and tell them that it was young people who got to do it. Claudette Coven was one. The students at at and in North Carolina who started the demonstration which resulted in the passage of the Public Accommodation Act. Not only that, it was also uh, uh, Sammy Young, a college student at Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, where I live now, was the first college student who was killed for exercising his constitutional right to try and use a restroom. So I want our young people to understand that young folks play a major role in the civil rights movement. And I want you to understand that although the civil rights movement, there were many unsung heroes whose names never appear in print, whose faces never appear on television, but whose moral courage laid the foundation and made it possible by the recognition of Mrs. Parks and Dr. King and many others that we see and that we celebrate. I say to our black males, in the wake of what I think to be the unlawful killing of young black men in Ferguson, Missouri, in New York, in Cleveland, and elsewhere in the country, is that we still have a country of laws and not a country of men. We must teach our children the rule of law. We must teach them that notwithstanding the inequalities and inequities, there still exists and there is hope, and we must pursue that hope. Raised in the great of the Confederacy in Montgomery, my father died when I was two, and my mother had 
very little formal education. But if I was able, while a, teen, of a teenager, to decide that I was going to do something about destroying desegregation, and then went ahead and prepared myself for it to the extent that I could represent the Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and others. If I could do that under those circumstances and other lawyers and other individuals around the country could do it, then I say to all of us, we still have hope and we need to instill that time of hope in our young people. We got this other condition that we found ourselves as hope. Those of us who are adults have a responsibility. We must be willing to do all we can to help our youth rise up. You can do it, and we must do it, because if, and I go back and remember what my mother told me, and we were as poor as anybody in our communities, but we didn't know we were poor. We were discriminated against, and we didn't even worry about being discriminated against. But you know what she told us? And this is what I say, and I tell our young people today. It's old-fashioned, but I think it's good. I tell them, as my mother told the five of us, and I was the youngest of the five, and only two, my father died. She said, you can be anything you want to be if you do three things. One. Keep Christ first in your life. Two, stay in school and get a good education. And three, stay out of trouble. Don't get involved in this criminal justice system because it is not always just. I think I have told you that I'd be the first to tell you that we've made some progress. Notwithstanding our progress in recent years, we have seen an increase in racism, including burning of churches and the resurgence of hate groups all over the nation. The United States Supreme Court, for over a quarter of a century, pioneered the rights of minorities, including women. But in recent years, that court has almost gotten to the point now where we can't really depend upon it to help us. We have also seen in the United States District Courts and the Courts of Appeals across this nation, which in the past used to help minorities and women, in recent months, we have seen an assault on affirmative action and other constitutional safeguards. So then, what does all of that mean as we meet here in Southfield, Michigan on January the 19th, 2015? There are some people who think we've made it, but I don't think we have. Where are we today? I want to leave you with a challenge. If what I have said to you means anything, it means, unfortunately, that racism is still alive in this country. If the life and work of Dr. King means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, particularly for minorities and women. It means that that is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have made, whether we will secure them and move forward, or whether we will lose them. If we lose, it means that Dr. King and all the others who have given their lives for protection of individual rights will have died in vain. But if we lose, we're not the only one that do. The nation loses. The struggle has not ended. 
Racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level of playing field. There is no such thing as race neutral uh, society in America. The consequences of over 350 years of slavery, segregation, and discrimination has not disappeared in the last 50 years with respect to the Voting Rights Act, in the last 60 years with respect to the Montgomery Bus Boycott. And Dr. King's dream has not been truly fulfilled, fulfilled. But we must continue to work. We are also challenged to teach the civil rights history to our children. We now have at least two generations of people who know nothing about overt segregation. And they think the job that they're able to get, that they get them just because they are so good or they are so educated. And what they don't realize that they get those jobs on the backs of other people who suffered and who didn't have them. But they don't know about it, so we're going to have to teach them. That's why about 15 years ago, we started the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center in Tuskegee. It's a small uh, museum that is developing to one of the best ones in the nation, and we want you to come and see it. And what I've been doing across in order to educate our children on it and have a place where they can see it, but I'm invited to speeches like that. I, I don't accept the honorarium. I accept the invitation and that money goes to the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural. And I want to thank your board for the contribution that you made to us. The question then is, where do we go from here? And that's what we all want to know. There are four things I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to sit down. One, racism is still alive and is real in this country and it's wrong. There are so many people who think that because we have these laws and because conditions have improved that we have everything we have and we don't need to be talking about civil rights anymore. But you can go to the same schools get the same education. And when there's a choice between a white kid and a minority kid, the chances are the white one will get it and the minority won't. You can look at the disparity that exists in every index. And the National Urban League makes it, uh, a report to the president on the status of African Americans. And every one of those index you see, there is a disparity between the have and the have not, and it's getting wider instead of narrowing. So racism is a problem, and until we recognize that it's a problem, we'll never solve it. Secondly, it's not going to go away by itself. You've got to come up with a plan. Now, you have a big production here today, but you know it didn't just happen. It took plans. It took work. The Montgomery bus boycott didn't just happen. It took plans. It took work. So the second thing, once we recognize that racism is a problem, and this nation has never really faced up to the race question, we can solve all the problems in the world, but we can't solve our own problems at home. We're going to have to come up with a plan. So your leaders need to get together. And once we come up with a plan, a plan is no good unless you are able to implement that plan. And then the last thing is, we all want racism to go away. We all want all these things that we have engaged in to be over. But you know what? We want somebody else to do it. If we are going to be able to destroy racism in this country, each one of us is going to have to do it. It is so ingrained until it takes the federal government, the state government, the county and local government, the educational institutions, the corporations, the fraternities, the sororities, the social clubs, the churches. It's going to take all of us working together to do away with racism. And whenever we get to that point, we will just.
just about have equality. And I want to leave you with this. Some years ago, Governor Wilder, the first African-American governor of uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, in his inaugural address, he said something to the young people that I think is still good, not only to young people, but to all of us. And I'm going to leave you with it here today. And this is what he said. I want them to know that oppression can be lifted, that discrimination can be eliminated, that poverty need not be binding, that disability can be overcome, and that for all of opportunities in a free society carries with it the requirements of hard work, the rejection of drugs and other false highs, and a willingness to work with others, whatever their race or nationality may be. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon.